Uh, all right, so first, uh, thank you so much to the conference organizers for, for having me. Uh, it's a great, obviously, audience to, to present a paper like this. Uh, it's especially nice to see a lot of familiar faces. I would have preferred to see them in person, but you know, maybe next uh, next year. So uh, so this paper is about uh, competition in product markets uh, in the presence of crypto tokens and smart contracts. Uh, this is a third uh, you know, theory paper in the same session. I'm going to try to make it very easy and not show any equations, just some, some pictures. Uh, for an audience like this, uh, I'm probably uh, should skip on the overview of what crypto tokens and smart contracts are. I'm going to go straight to the uh, to the motivation, uh, and I'm going to use an example uh, that is uh, used very frequently in this literature, uh, that of Filecoin. I'm also going to have some more examples that that Ye mentioned in his presentation uh, earlier. The fact that there is, uh, you know, that good examples are scarce, you know, maybe indicates that, uh, you know, that the whole industry is still in its uh, infancy, but, you know, that makes it interesting to explore. So, uh, Filecoin uh, was basically, uh, you know, is intended to be a platform for uh, decentralized digital storage, uh, where users can rent out uh, their capacity and in return they would receive uh, FIL uh, tokens. Right? The idea basically is to enter an existing established market. Uh, with existing storage platform. There are some decentralized ones, uh, such as SIA or storage, uh, but there are you know, bigger, uh, more, more well-known players, you know, such as Dropbox or OneBox or Google Drive, right? And this is basically the market where Filecoin was expected uh, or is expecting to, to, to compete, right? Uh, so what this paper does is basically looks at the cost and the benefits of issuing cryptographic tokens and using smart contracts in a setting where a new entrant, an entrepreneurial venture, expects to compete in a market that already uh, exists and where there are some incumbents. Right? Uh, it's going to be a very simple model of uh, competition between two firms, so the entrant and the incumbent. Uh, an important element in the model is going to be switching costs, right? So the idea is that if I'm using Dropbox right now, it's going to take me some, some effort and cost to switch to a different platform, you know, such as uh, such as Filecoin, right? So, uh, you know, part of the model is going to be the incumbent kind of thinking about how to attach the customers, uh, you know, uh, that are, that will be comp competing with the entrant uh, later on. Uh, so, the, the the crux of the model is that it shows that uh, in addition to the usual kind of benefits of initial coin offerings at the financing stage, right? So there's a big literature which I'm going to mention in a minute that looks at the financing of, uh, of you know, using, using tokens. There are also benefits at the product market competition stage, right? And those benefits, as I'm going to try to show, uh, are going to be due to the ability of tokens and smart contracts to commit the entrant to certain out of market strategies that is going to increase its equilibrium value. One of the implications of this is going to be on the pricing of, of goods and services, right? And in many cases, uh, use, the use of crypto tokens and smart contracts are actually going to lead to higher equilibrium prices for the consumers. I'm going to try to touch upon this point at the very end. All right, so uh, this, this paper uh, fits into three broad uh, types of literature. The first one is on the cost of benefits of issuing tokens. Uh, this is a quite large and growing literature. Uh, two of the today's presenters are, uh, you know, uh, very important parts of this, this literature. What I contribute here or try to contribute is that uh, this is the first model to, uh, to use multi-firm uh, setting, right? All of the other papers are basically about optimization from the standpoint of one firm. Uh, and this is also, uh, I think, the first model to, to look at the non-financing related benefit of crypto tokens. There are some other papers, so, so I'm not sure whether the kind of first is a good description here. It's one of the first. Um, uh, there is also literature on the general benefits of blockchain technology and smart contracts. Uh, I try to add to this literature by uh, kind of thinking about how uh, tokens and smart contracts can lead to commitment to future prices, output prices, and how that uh, you know, could be beneficial for firms using crypto tokens and smart contracts. And then there is an old literature from the 80s and 90s uh, about competition and switching, co switching costs. For obvious reasons, you know, this literature did not consider uh, crypto tokens as part of the available strategies. And you know, I'm trying to do this here and contribute a little bit to that lit literature as well. Uh, I'm going to introduce first uh, a very simple kind of benchmark models, model without tokens so that I can uh, kind of quickly transition into what happens when I introduce tokens and smart contracts to see exactly what the effects are. 
Uh, so there are two firms, the incumbent that are called I and the entrant called E. Uh, they're competing uh, under the trunk competition with homogeneous goods. So they produce the same thing basically. Uh, the incumbent operates for two periods and the entrant enters in the second period. Uh, I assume zero entry cost because deterring entry is not the point of this, of this paper. It basically, the point is to try to see what happens, what are the optimal pricing strategies once the entry had occurred. Uh, for the same reason, I abstract from production costs uh, because I want to, to focus exclusively on pricing and assume that production costs are zero. Uh, the incumbent maximizes the sum of its expected profits over the two periods, uh, and the decision variable is going to be pricing its product in the first and the second period. Uh, I in the second period stands for incumbent, obviously, because there is also the, the entrant. Um, uh, I ignore discounting here, but that doesn't play any, any role. Uh, the entrant only plays in the second period, so he tries to maximize expected profit by also setting its, its price. Now, to the demand side of the market, in the first period, there is a mass of consumers, I call it Q1. Uh, their evaluation, they have different valuations of the incumbent's technology. Their valuations are distributed, uh, in this case, uniformly between zero and one. This is just for simplicity, it doesn't really uh, make a difference. Uh, and we get a super simple uh, you know, uh, equation for the uh, demand uh, or equilibrium quantity in the first period, conditional on the price that the incumbent has set in the first period for the output. In the second period, uh, the mass of consumers growth, there is some growth rate of G that is uh, you know, equal or higher than, than zero. Uh, now, importantly, in the second uh, period, the firms, the incumbent and the entrant, they set their product prices simultaneously and non-cooperatively and cannot change them after that, right? The usual argument is menu cost, right? So when once the menu is printed, you know, it's, it's hard or costly to, to change the price in the menu. Uh, but this argument has been used, you know, obviously outside of the restaurant industry uh, as well. So we assume that once prices are set, they're set in stone. Uh, there are two types of customers in the second period. The first one is the so-called detached customers, right? So there is a mass of customers that bought from the incumbent in the first period, right? And those are the ones that are going to stay with the incumbent, right? So if I use Dropbox in the first period, I assume that I'm attached to Dropbox, I'm not going to use Filecoin, right? This is a restrictive assumption. It's possible to solve the model with kind of less than infinite switching costs. Uh, it's just a little bit more difficult algebraically, but the logic is, is still the same. And then there is the new customers, right? Those that didn't buy from the incumbent in the first period, right? And are free to choose, you know, either Dropbox or Filecoin, right? Depending on what maximizes their utility uh, best. Uh, both type of customers have, again, different valuations. Uh, they're also distributed uniformly between zero and one. And as I said, attached customers have large switching costs, so can only buy from the incumbent. The new customers buy from the firm that you know, gives the better price, right? And uh, because basically the products are, are, are homogeneous. All right, uh, in a setting like this, and it's a known result, it's not mine, uh, there is no pure strategy in Nash equilibrium because everybody tries kind of to, uh, to underprice the other guy. And then, you know, when the price is too low, the price basically, be, you know, they, the price goes back to being very high. Uh, there is, you know, a mixed strategy in Nash equilibrium that I'm trying to, to characterize here. Uh, and uh, the result basically is the following. I'm going to show you a picture. Uh, the upper picture describes the incumbents, uh, profits, quantities, and, uh, and prices in the first period. And the lower picture, you know, describes the entrance and the incumbents, profits in the second period. So if you remember your kind of Econ 101 class, uh, you know, if you have a monopolistic market in one period, uh, basically, you know, we should observe kind of a, a square representing a profit. The price should be one half uh, and, uh, you know, and the quantity should be one half of the highest possible quantity as well. Uh, this is not what, what not what's happening here. The price is lower, the quantity is higher. The reason is that incumbent has an incentive to basically attach some of the customers, uh, you know, to the second period in order for it to be able to exploit them in the second period, which it does here. So the equilibrium is, uh, you know, in the second period, a mixed strategy equilibrium, but the expected profits are represented by this picture here they're the same as if the incumbent would charge the monopolistic price, in this case of one half to the attached customers and basically, uh, you know, mill them, uh, you know, completely. Uh, the entrance profits uh, are characterized by this uh, kind of upper bound of this, uh, uh, of this green rectangle, 
which basically is the price below which the incumbent is not willing to go because he has the fallback option to try to, you know, to charge monopolistic price to attach customers and not compete for the unattached one, right? Uh, so basically here, just remember those, those, those rectangle areas, the green one is the entrance profit and the blue ones are the incumbent's profit in the uh, you know, first and second period. Now let's get to the kind of interesting part. Uh, what happens if the entrant decides to issue crypto tokens? Uh, so let's uh, kind of explain you know, how the model is going to work. Uh, so prior to the product market competition stage, the entrant issues theta crypto token, right? He as as usual uh, in those types of models and also in practice, the entrant accepts to commit, uh, uh, sorry, commits to accept those tokens as the sole means of payment for its product. Importantly, it quotes the price of its product in unit of tokens that I'm going to denote by small theta and sell the tokens to interested customers for a price that is going to be determined in equilibrium, right? So this is basically the main kind of takeaway from the paper, right? So what happens is that the fact that the entrant uh, commits to prices the, 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 the product in, in crypto tokens basically introduces another stage of the game where potential consumers are bidding for the, uh, you know, for those tokens in order to later use them in order to buy the product. And what it does, it, it basically transforms a simultaneous price competition into a sequential price competition, right? Where both firms uh, set their prices simultaneously, but the entrant sets the price in tokens. After that, there has to be a stage where those tokens are priced in the market, right? And that's what transforms the competition into sequential, right? So the entrant is always going to be the second mover relative to the income. Now in equilibrium, the price of the token is basically going to be determined by the price of the incumbent's good in dollars relative to the price in tokens of the entrant good, right? So if Dropbox, you know, charges hundred dollars a year for its service, and Filecoin would charge, you know, five, uh, you know, units of token for its service. And if you assume that the services are identical, then basically I'm going to uh, be willing to pay up to twenty dollars per one unit of Filecoin token, right? And nobody would be willing to pay more for it. Now there are a few implicit assumptions here that are quite restrictive, right? that the price is quoted in the entrant proprietary token. That's super important. And that's the reason why this whole idea cannot work with fiat currency, right? Because dollars are not specific to this, to this project or to the product. Uh, we need to assume that there is a liquid market for the entrance token and that the price is correct, right? So there are no speculators biasing the price away from the equilibrium price. What's gonna happen in equilibrium is very, is very simple, right? So the incumbent now knows that whatever price uh, you know, he uh, charges for his product uh, in the second period, the equilibrium fiat currency equivalent price of the entrant is always going to be low, right? Because the market forces are going to adjust the price of the, of the token such that the fiat currency equivalent price of the entrant's product is going to be just below the price of the incumbent. So in equilibrium, actually nothing much happens to the incumbent, right? So, so this blue uh, rectangle areas are the same as before. Uh, now it's it's a pure strategic equilibrium, so it's not an expected profit, but a realized profit. But you know, from the expectation standpoint, the incumbent is exactly uh, as well off with the entrant price in crypto than without. What what is different here is the profit of the entrant, right? So the uh, the pink area here represents the profit without pricing in crypto that I showed in the previous case. The green uh, you know, rectangular area is the profit of the entrant under pricing crypto, right? The reason basically is very simple. The incumbent has no incentive to lower the price below the monopoly price because the incumbent knows that he will, he will always be beaten by the entrant in terms, of, in terms of the price, right? So all of the unattached customers are always going to go to the, to the entrant, right? And only the attached customers uh, are those that the incumbent can sell to. If that's the case, then the incumbent basically ignores the unattached customers in equilibrium and just sets monopoly price to the attached customers. And that obviously benefits the entrant because you know, the green array is larger than the pink one, okay? So that's basically kind of the, the crux of the, of the benefit of pricing in crypto tokens. Now, um, if you think that this is just a theoretical possibility, there are some world, uh, real world examples of uh, you know, ventures trying to do this. So uh, you know, I mentioned Filecoin before. Uh, there are a couple of platforms um, that are uh, basically provided decentralized marketplace for performing computations. iExec is a French one that is fully operational. 
Golem is sort of half operational, but you know both of those uh, state explicitly that they price uh, their services in proprietary tokens. Uh, and uh, you know, Ye also mentioned this Brave, uh, which is the internet browser that pays users for 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 watching ads. There, the pricing is also in units of in of native native tokens, right? So it's 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 beginning to be done in practice. You know, not very widely, but it seems like you know some firms at least uh, you know uh, realize some of the advantages of pricing in in crypto. Uh, I don't have much time, so let me just briefly kind of touch upon the usefulness of smart contracts in in this setting, right? Uh, as I'll argue in a second, price, uh, you know, smart contracts can uh, be a way to commit to future output prices by the, by the end. Now, price commitment in general uh, has two issues. First of all, uh, in, you know, price commitment in fiat currency is typically not credible and time inconsistent. There are many papers showing this. Now, I also show in my paper that in, even if it was possible to make it time consistent and credible, uh, it would not be a good idea for the for the entrant to commit to future prices. The, the you know its equilibrium pro profit is going to be low, right? Now, what I'm going to try to show is that committing in uh, you know to prices in in um, in crypto uh, currency using smart contracts might actually benefit the the entrant, right? So let's make an additional assumption. Let's assume that in addition to issuing crypto tokens, the entrant can commit to future price in units of tokens. Right. What it does is the following. So let's say that the entrant has issued, you know, 1,000 tokens, and it says that the price in crypto tokens of its product is going to be 10, uh, you know, tokens, right? And then basically uh, sets a de facto quantity constraint or capacity constraint on the entrant. The entrant cannot sell more than 1,000 divided by 10, which is 100 products, right? Why would the entrant want to do it? Well, basically, it's uh, limiting itself in the second period guarantees some customer base to the incumbent in the second period, regardless of whether the incumbent kind of worked for, to, you know, to build this attached customer base or, or not, right? And so it mitigates the incumbent's incentive to increase the massive attached customers. That means that the incumbent can basically focus on uh, generating monopoly profits in the first period, so getting higher profits in the first period. And as a result, might compromise on the profit in the second period, and this, you know, extra profit might go to the to the entry. Uh, I'm going to talk about two types of uh, of a smart contract. Uh, so the commitment can be unconditional or conditional on the product price of the incumbent, uh, and this is like a derivative, right? It's really easy to implement. The only issue, it's not, you know, the price of the incumbent's product is not something that's on chain, right? But you know, one can think of using oracles to basically uh, make sure that uh, you know the commitment can be can be implemented. Uh, let me show you briefly what's going to happen with unconditional commitment. Right, as I told you, the incumbent basically focuses on uh, getting the monopoly profits in the first period. Right, so that's why the incumbent's profits are different in the upper figure than before. Right, uh, the incumbent now becomes the residual claimant. Right, on the uh, on the consumers in the second period. Uh, so the entrant here in the second period is to the left and the incumbent is to the right, right? And you think that the entrant would benefit, right? For the reasons that I, that I mentioned, the only problem is that because the incumbent is the residual claimant, he has incentives now to lower the price, right? And that's basically uh, why the price of the incumbent here uh, that's represented by the blue rectangle is lower than the monopoly price. And we know that the entrance price is going to be always lower, slightly lower in equilibrium than the incumbent price, right? And basically the entrance here moves from the pink rectangle to a green rectangle whose area is smaller, right? So the equilibrium profit goes down. The problem is exactly the incumbent incentives to alter its pricing strategy in the, in the second period, right? So what can the entrant do? Well, the entrant can use a conditional smart contract and basically say, well, you know, if the incumbent charges a monopolistic price of one half in the second period, which is good for everybody, then I'm going to, uh, you know, the price of the, uh, of in tokens of my product is going to be such that imposes the capacity constraint. If the incumbent deviates from this pricing, well, then all hell breaks loose. You know, I'm going to price uh, the tokens, uh, you know, the, the product uh, with a very low price in tokens, basically eliminating the capacity constraints, and we're back to square one. Okay. Uh, what's going to happen is, the following. It's the same picture as before, but now the equilibrium price that incumbent wants to charge for its product in the second period is one half. The incumbent gets slightly higher profits than before, you know, combining the first and the second period. The entrant, you know, because of the substitution between the first and the second period, right, 
is able to get this wedge in the middle, which is the extra profit of the entrant due to uh, you know, commitment to future prices in smart contracts over and above the benefit that the entrant gets from pricing in crypto tokens. Right? Uh, so there are basically two benefits here, right? The first one is you know, kind of setting this extra stage in competition, right? That's the benefit of pricing in crypto. And then the pricing of committing to future pricing crypto is basically because of this transition or um, you know, substitution between first and second period profits of the incumbent that goes to the, to the entrant in equilibrium. Um, I also analyze a case where the incumbent also issues crypto tokens, right? So basically given that, you know, issuing crypto tokens is so nice, the incumbent might also want to do it. And then, you know, I kind of show that if the growth in the market is high enough, then both firms have incentives to issue tokens and price, uh, you know, their products in units of crypto tokens, right? Uh, let me very briefly kind of recap what we've done here. Uh, this is one of the first papers to examine the effects of issuing crypto tokens in a competitive setting, right? So that's, uh, that's a contribution. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are two advantages for the entrant. Uh, I'm not going to repeat myself. Uh, now, what's important here is that uh, this paper belongs to a very small uh, emerging literature that looks at benefits uh, to, uh, you know, of issuing crypto tokens uh, at the utility stage, right? for product pricing in particular, as opposed to the benefits, uh, you know, as security tokens in the pre r and you know, financing state, right? Uh, and, you know, uh, you can see from the pictures, right? This might not, uh, you know, uh, uh, be good for consumers. Uh, and, you know, despite the fact that SEC might see the benefits of using utility tokens, the antitrust authorities uh, might actually be concerned with the effects of uh, of using crypto tokens for for pricing, right? So uh, that's all I have. Thank you so much.